Friends Podcast. Hi, I'm Diane Hunt. I am an impressionist realist painter connecting with nature through my brush. I work in oil paint and watercolor and I live in the countryside of Maryland's eastern shore, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. You can find me online at dianehuntstudio.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Diane Hunt Studio. Hi, I'm Constance Brosson of Steve Brosson's Jewelry Designs. I live in Oklahoma on a prairie, and I make uh, handmade jewelry in silver, copper, and brass. I'm an artist that paints. I paint pastels and in oil sometimes. Hello, this is Clyde JKL. I'm the host of this podcast. I am a emerging representational artist. I do historic rend- renderings, seascapes, landscapes, volcanicals, birds, and whatnot. With a tight illustrative hand in watercolor, pen and ink, and acrylic paints. And I live in Oklahoma City. And it is Monday again. This is by J. Kell, and it's time for the Artist Friends Podcast, episode 74 for Monday, December the 7th, 2020. And I'm here with my two best artist friends, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. And hello, Diane. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Constance. Hello, everyone. Hello, Constance. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Diane. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the broad podcast. I'm so glad you two show up and keep me company each week. Truly, as an artist, I live a lonely life <laughs> and I isolate. <laughs> and with every, you know, people who are not used to living that way with the COVID and keeping themselves isolated, you know, it's stressful. But for me, it's my normal life. So nothing's changed for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If our listeners will go to www. Talkartpodcast.com. That's talkartpodcast.com. You'll see the subject links there. And this week we are going to talk about our uh, our studio practice and our uh, creating art and uh, what we do and everything. And some uh, a uh, podcast from Stephen Baumo. He talks about uh, art magnet and uh, performance anxiety. So. Uh, We'll weave that in, into our uh, discussion. One thing I want to ask Diane and Constance, I'll start with Diane. Um, when you're creating your art, you're working on a painting, do you have any background music or anything going in the background? Or? I don't usually have anything on, but if I do, it's always instrumental type music. I don't listen to anything that has words to it, usually. So it's very um, neutral, I guess, in my brain. <laughs> okay. Awesome. What about you? Well, I do have a radio over here in the studio, and I used to put in my own CDs and stuff, but I've tuned to a, a radio station here that I like to listen to the music there, and, and they give us a lot of information about what's going on around the area, and it's country music. So, yeah, I have changed to country music. <laughs> I used to listen to rock and roll when I was younger, but. I like country music now. <laughs> that twang while you're painting there, huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, but it's the older, it's the older country music from the, from the, um, you know, like Hank Williams and Do so, people of that. Me, so the, they have another station that has newer. Yeah, I grew up with country and western music. My, uh, my mother listened to it all the time, and I was force fed it. As soon as I got out of the house, I swore I would never listen to it again. <laughs> I did the same thing. 
<laughs> but you know, I've gotten older. I listen to uh, Broadway, listen to country music. I just yeah. like it. Loretta Lynn and Tammy Wynette, and uh, those are the ones I remember off the top of my head. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah she used to and and we used to go around the house on the weekends so depressed she would listen to that sad country western music you know my dog got hit by a truck and <laughs> my wife well, here in oklahoma and you know that clyde but there it's it's like the area besides being from you know from uh where they used to go to be found uh they have the music here that Everybody likes it. I'm trying to think of it. It's the cowboy music. Western type music, yeah. Yeah, the, and it's singing cowboys. And I really think that's cute. You know, I never, if you would say that to me when I was younger, that I would like this kind of music. I'd have told you were crazy. <laughs> but uh, I guess I just got tired of all the rock and roll, and they just play. They don't play all of the rock and roll here. They only pick, you know, about 100 songs that they play over and over again instead of playing a full list of people that do rock and roll from the sixties and on up, you know, so I kind of gravitated toward the, the uh, country music because it's the uh, kind of like the oldies that the one station that I listen to is kind of like the oldies. And I like that. And they mix some newer stuff in there, but it's not the progressive new country music that they have. So my, in my case, it, it depends on what I'm working on. If I'm, if I'm working on my pulp radio art illustrations, then it's the uh, old time radio shows and it's usually I listen to an episode or several episodes from the series that I'm creating a sketch from, you know, so it's maybe sci-fi and maybe horror and maybe uh, crime or, you know, whatever. So I've, if I'm just working on a general painting or whatever, then, you know, I just have a movie going or I have something playing on the, on the other computer. You know, sometimes instrumental music or maybe a podcast, you know, or something or an audio book, you know, I'll have playing about half paying attention to it and working on my art. What it's doing is it's helping me focus. Complete dead silence. I can't create any art whatsoever. <laughs> I can, but I like to have something, some background, something going on. Have, I've, 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 I've always been that way. I remember uh, years ago. When I was living over in Italy, and uh, I would, when I was off work, I'd be at home. My wife, you know, she also she had a a work a job, and one time she came home, she was so angry at me because here's my my uh, daughter at that time, my youngest daughter, was like only three or four years old. She's sitting in the middle of the floor in the living room, playing with her dolls or and and singing up up a storm. The TV is going blaring. I got the radio blaring, and I'm laying on on the couch reading a book. <laughs> now that would find that hard to deal with. <laughs> That's too much input. Turn off the TV. What is wrong with you? How can you? <laughs> but that's how my brain, you know. I I it would help you focus. Yeah, I used to do that when I was younger too. Nothing yeah. else going on. But now. You know, now, now I can do it either way, but a lot of times I don't have anything at all. I'm just, it's just quiet. It's oh. so nice to have quiet. <laughs> so I don't get enough quiet sometimes, I guess. Yeah. Or I'm, I'm listening to instrumental kind of music. And it's more like, more um, like um, Anya and um, New Age kind of <laughs> um, soft kind of music. I don't know. So anyhow, that uh, I, I just want, I was just curious. I was thinking about it the other day. <laughs> Maybe our listeners, you know, would, would uh, you know, like to know about that because I. Yeah. Now at Christmas time, I try to find stations that play just Christmas music because I really do like Christmas music a lot. Oh, yeah. I have a whole, uh, I've got all the class. I've got Christmas music from way back in the 30s and 40s. Of course, you know, running my internet radio station, you know, I play that. And. I've got that going and sometimes I'll have my internet radio station playing when I'm working on arts, you know? So, Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's a given. The holiday music always, you know, get, gets played, you know? And, um, when I'm, you know, cr you know, great, great in the art, you know, and everything. But, uh, I used to think that people didn't care, you know, about our process, but I'm finding that I, you know, different people I encounter, 
they're really interested in how we, you know, create art, you know, and what motivates us and what inspires us and how we go about it. And sometimes some of the even particular details, you know, well, what made you use that brush or that color or, you know, and sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to answer these questions. Now we, 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 we just, uh, but well, that's what I felt like using today. <laughs> but listening to Stephen Bauman, anyway, now Diane, she's had the benefit of a of a college education in art, art training. But in my case, I haven't. So I always gave the answer, well, that's that's because that's what you use. Now <laughs> I've taken that course with uh, Kelly Folsom, you know, in a painting. I've listened to Stephen Bauman of I understand such things as I magnet composite composition theory and temperature color color temperature and all these different things that which when I would would never take in consideration I would just naturally do to create a painting I now it's now on purpose and I now now in consideration so what we're going to do is for our YouTube uh listeners and viewers there we are going to show our art and i had uh, diane and constance send me an image and we're going to talk about eye magnets and see if they employed the stephen bauman's um, eye magnet discussion <laughs> let me click on the screen and bring up one of those images are you seeing are you seeing your image diane? yeah yeah mm -hmm. okay nice bar for our audio listeners this is a painting that uh, Diane created. It is a, it's like a barn in a distance in a painting with a grass field around and there is some trees in the background and a sky with clouds in it. And Diane, describe what Stephen Bauman, when he uh, says eye magnets, what, what exactly are eye magnets? Um, he uses a couple different ways of attracting your eye to certain points and one of them is hard edges and um this barn has quite a few hard edges on it i guess that kind of direct your eye to different places um i'm trying to think what other what other uh, things he talks about it, yeah hard, um, uh, <clears throat> color temperature placement of items in order to direct your eye in other words, you, yeah, I mean, I have the, the path kind of leads up to the barn and it takes you into the opening and then you kind of follow the edge of the barn out and it takes you to the far, the field way in the distance. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then the tree line kind of brings you back around and so does the grass, the grasses and stuff all bring you back around. You kind of keep moving around in the painting because. Yeah, and it's, um, and I, it's great in motion, motion in your painting. Like you said, you start out with. At the very bottom here, at the uh, left-hand side, and you follow that path, and it takes you all the way up into the barn opening, and then the far edge. If I take the pointer, point over. Do you see my pointer mm -hmm. here? And this, <coughs> I you know back into the distance area, and kind of it has some. It, it has a bit of a mystery, like what what's back there? You know, what's back behind those trees? You know, and but then your eye is brought right back with, you know, with, with the trees, you know? And so you're, you're brought back into the pain. You're not completely. So, yeah, I think this is a very good example of, uh, of eye magnets and uh, the, uh, the flow, a way of controlling your, you know, your eyes you know, and everything. And it's like in one of his uh, episodes, he said, we're, we're like uh, uh, magicians, shamans. You know, we actually can control people with uh with our paintings we can control the movement of their eyes if we, if we do it right so uh, this is a very very good good example better than the one i had selected that i was going to use <laughs> that today okay, let's see who some else. of them are more subtle than others so it's hard to um you know see it sometimes but <clears throat> i'm not going to use today because i really liked because <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, with you know the trees and the shadows, you know. But anyhow, let's move on. The Constance. 
Okay, Constance, this is this is her uh, one of her lesson paintings in the same class that I was in with Kelly Folsom. And for our audio listeners, it is a still life of a uh, copper pot with a couple looks like tomatillas, tomatillas green, and then a, a jar of mustard. Yeah, a jar of mustard seed. Yeah, and uh, on the on a shelf, and then there's <laughs> uh, uh, like a a uh, uh, cloth or something. Yeah, a cloth or white cloth. Yeah, white cloth. We'll use the rule of thirds in this one. <laughs> Over, you know, but uh, of course, Kelly. All, I know Kelly follows the uh, good composition because all of her uh, lesson paintings, the photographs, she, she does all the settings, and then is uh, is already taken into consideration the eye ma- magnet. So, one thing that Stephen Bauman talks is that some artists say they, they uh, have a tendency they they make a shelf, they have the horizontal line of the shelf, but then their eye is taken out of the painting and doesn't come back. But if right. you put a piece of cloth hanging over the edge, that holds your eye. And that's exactly what this, this composition does. You know, your 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 eye is taken over here to the where the handle is at, and then it just it's brought all the way across, you know, the the uh with the painting and and it also follows the uh uh, uh the the golden mean principle of uh you know your <coughs> your main focal point looks like is right here and then it pulls, you know, your eye is pulled all the way in a uh, spiral motion around through the whole painting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think that uh, is a, a really you know, good example of the, what, you know, one of the principles that he's talking about. All right. Now it's Clyde's turn. <laughs> you guys think I, did I do it? Where's, where's my main focal point at? Tell me where my main focal point is. To me, well, the, it's the bottle. Yeah, the bottle. I was going to say the same thing. Yep. <clears throat> the brightest thing in the picture is the bottle. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the star of the show. Create more of a, a, a circle of motion because it goes counterclockwise. Starts with the bottle <clears throat> up to the top of the lamp, the book's in the corner, and it comes all the way out and uh, with, the, with the rose. And then, you know, it comes, it comes back. You know, it's one of the things he's. He's got a, you know, it always says a shelf. When you have a horizontal line, you got to have something that pulls your eye back. And when I first created it, all I had before was was just the books, the lamp, and the bottles. I had nothing else on the shelf. And I kept looking at it, and I kept looking. I said, no, it needs something because your eye was was like falling over here. But then uh-huh. I put that rose, and that rose brings you right back into the painting. You know, you're. Uh, and the the uh, light reflection kind of keeps you uh, your hold, you know, in in the painting. So I'm very proud of this that that I uh, incorporated all the you know composition principle uh, that uh, with eye magnets and uh, more or less the uh, the uh, you know the go to mean you know rule. And it's, it's not a hundred percent, but uh, it sure it certainly is uh, you know, close enough. What do you two think? Think I did it? Yeah, I think you did. You pulled it off. You can also use the rule of thirds on this one too, and it still works, you know. So. Yeah, exactly. They're yeah, done. it keeps it keeps you going around inside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> one thing he's that Stephen said was that a lot of people they you start you go into the painting and you just go right back off and onto the next painting because that there's nothing making you turn back into the painting to look at it some more, you know. Exactly. If it was hanging in a museum with other, or in a gallery with other paintings, you're right. They would look at it, and their eye would, would just keep on going. It would fall off would go on to the next one. And the idea is you want to capture, you want to capture their eye. You want to keep their, uh, you know, keep the viewer's attention. All right. So I thought, so for our uh, uh, YouTube viewers, You'll be able to see those. I'll put those in the uh, YouTube version of the podcast. The next thing that he talked about is performance anxiety. I really enjoyed enjoyed that. Was kind of funny. Uh, Diane, what's your what's your thoughts on that? You have you have performance anxiety? <laughs> I, I don't know that I do really. I, <laughs> that sounds kind of <laughs> weird, but I can't. I guess I probably did when I was younger. I don't know that I do so much now. 
<clears throat> like especially when I was in art school, I mean, it was like the the weird thing about going to art school was that like the school when I was in high school, I was like the artist in the class, you know, I was like <laughs> the best of it, you know. And then you go to art school and everybody's the best. So it's like <laughs> you don't you don't stand out anymore. So it's you kind of like, you know, you worry about that a little bit, like, you know, everybody's like trying to outdo one another and we're all pretty good. So, you know, there was a lot of anxiety about that at the time, I guess. But um, another thing in that same podcast, he talks about <laughs> murdering and pain and painting. Yeah. Have you murdered any paintings recently? <laughs> oh gosh, I can't. I can't tell you how many paintings I've murdered. <laughs> but you know, there's a lesson to be learned from murdered paintings. <laughs> you know, that's how not to murder it again the same way. <laughs> Well, this is what he's talking about here. He says, if you, know, if you murder a body, a human, you know, you, uh, you, know, you can dispose of the body and clean up the mess and maybe no one will, will, will find out. But when you murder a painting, which means you really mess it up, everybody knows about it. You can't hide it, you know, because if you're, if you're married and, and you spend all that time out in the countryside doing a plain air painting but you just have performance anxiety your eye magnets aren't working and you just come back with something awful so you come back with nothing and then your spouse gets really upset thinking that maybe you're playing around you just spent eight hours away and you have nothing to show for it <laughs> it's a murder painting it's a, you know, it's a piece of artwork that you just completely utterly destroyed you know that that item that you were trying to to recreate you know what about you diana i know you've murdered some paintings <laughs> probably <laughs> probably more than i want to admit to <laughs> but i liked his analogy about um piano or playing an instrument making music you don't have well especially years ago before they had recordings and stuff you didn't you didn't have any proof like that you actually took the time and I mean I, I I had piano lessons when I was a kid so I I knew exactly what he was talking about you have like no evidence once you play something <laughs> yeah. unless somebody recorded you or your parents <laughs> in the other room going oh my gosh that's so bad I'd be glad when she gets better <laughs> <laughs> but with a painting you have like physical proof it's like you can't you know unless you scraped it all down yep <laughs> it's there and you know when I was I did some work on um on a computer making artwork and it, it was a totally different experience because I didn't have anything physical to hold in my hands like when I was done it was the oddest thing like because I had never done that before and it was like you did all this work and you don't have anything like to hold in your hands unless you printed it out yeah so it was kind of it just it was a different That's experience all I used to do was digital computer artwork before I my daughters convinced me to start doing <clears throat> you know, physical painting and drawing. And you're right. And it's also a completely different satisfaction too. Mm -hmm. you, you spend hours and hours on some digital image, getting it to work right and dealing with all the technical aspects of it, you know, and everything. And maybe it looks great, but if you spent the same amount of time on doing a painting, the satisfaction is so different. So, so, you know, uh, much more, so, so more rewarding in my opinion, you know, and not to say anything bad about there's some really good digital artists out there, but I just, didn't. it's just, yeah, it's a different, you don't have the tact of, you know, it's like, you can't hold it in your hands, you know, it's like, yeah. I don't know. It's just, it's just different, but it, it's, it's really I've weird. I've made some jewelry and this is a good <laughs> example. I mean, I, when I first started making jewelry, I made it in copper and that wasn't so painful when you screwed something up but as i moved into silver and doing the wire wrapping if you screw up silver i mean that's painful you know <laughs> even when i was learning how to do um soldering you know it's so easy to melt all your pieces if you don't do it exactly right and you're sitting there and you go oh my gosh and i've actually gotten almost to the point of having the ring ready to put the stone in and the last little bit i was trying to you know get that that ring shank to stick to the cabochon and then you just hit it too hard with the heat and it just goes 
and just disappears (laughs) and you're going oh man that's so painful (laughs) god i've never experienced that but i yeah (laughs) i have several pieces of jewelry that just sits in the windowsill there and i just look at them and i go "Mm, yeah that was a bad one (laughs) you know some or some uh you follow a pattern that you bought or something and then you go to put it all together and then it's just really not all that stable to be worn as a piece of jewelry you know so i've had pieces mm-hmm. like that too that are so <laughs> intricate and i spent so many hours making it and then the end result was it's sitting on the shelf because you can't wear it because it's it's just yeah it not work stable out right. <laughs> you know so it's not strong enough or something so anyway yeah yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure we've all painted over paintings that we had, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or scraped them off and started over. <laughs> you know, whatever. But uh, before we uh, segue into the next video, which was which with concert was a good uh, a good segue. Let's take a uh, a brief break for a sponsor. Available at www dot mpir shop dot com are some unique design take a look at my work and if you like my style i could create a piece of artwork for you designed by me and they are at a very reasonable price too so please visit mpir shop dot com again mpir shop dot com that's www dot m-p-i-r shop dot com welcome back this is Clyde J. Kale and you're listening to the Artist Friends Podcast episode 74 for December 7th 2020 and I'm here with Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson and before we took the break I said let's segue into the last video which was from Sergio Gomez and it was discussing the uh, spending too much time on ideals before creating your art or or getting uh, uh the, exactly how do you say that overthinking overthinking that was it over <clears throat> creative ideals i think that's an excellent segue because you know constantly you get you know when jury you can if you're not careful you can you know really murder it you know and i think all of us um we uh we get a great idea to create a piece of artwork and the inspiration hits us. And then we start thinking about past experiences or where well, I did that once before and it came out horrible and then we don't do it. And his emphasis was just go with the flow. You guys want to add to that? Any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I, I sit with the ideas for a while, I think before I work on stuff. And I think a lot of times, I work out a lot of the um, problems I think I'm going to run into before I even start working. So that I, I do that now more than I did. I think before I jump into stuff, before I th- think them out. So I, in a way, it's kind of counter to what he's saying, but I don't do it to the point where I don't actually get any work done. But <clears throat> I think I spend more time... Um, I think you're coming from experience. I think as yeah, as, I'm thinking through what's going to happen before I actually do it, and then when I actually do it, it doesn't take as long. I don't make as many yeah. mistakes that way. <laughs> Landscapes are good to do like that. If you do like the little thumbnail sketches of trying to get everything where you want it before you start painting a painting of it, you know, in the black and white or pencil or even an ink pen, you know, something. Yeah, the no tans. Mm-hmm. so it's good to do you know if you do that there was something that i used to uh, never do and i started doing it after taking kelly <clears throat> is actually making a bit of a, of a grid either in painting or even with watercolors and pencil i make a a grid to make sure that i've got my placement correctly and figure you know, considering the composition yeah before i even start uh uh, in the case of uh, watercolors, start drawing it out all with you know within the grid. With the case of paint, uh, making a uh, you know uh, with the with just basic you know not drawing out with uh, the paintbrush you know, and then before I actually start 
start uh, working on locking in and everything. And uh, I think I think that comes you know that comes with experience. But what they're talking about is like, okay, you you get this fantastic idea for this great piece of artwork that you want to create, but then something either past experience or whatever, something in your mind starts saying, well, no, nah, no, nah, maybe, maybe not. No one's going to like that. Uh, uh, you know, maybe I can't sell that. And that's where you, before you know it, you start developing artist block, you know, and, and, and you end up not doing anything. That's pretty much what he was, you know, uh, I think he was talking about. And I'll admit, I... But yeah, I think there's certain things that we all probably think, oh, we can't, I can't do that. Like, it's too complicated for me or, or you know, it's beyond my my uh, skill level or, you know, whatever. You start that all negative talk in your head. Yeah. And, and I think Stinkin that's kind of. is what I like to call it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's pretty common. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, but sometimes you just have to push yourself through it and, you know. You find out, oh, it's not as bad as you thought, <laughs> or you know, you're yeah. Not as... City, cityscapes make me take pause before I start. <laughs> you cityscapes. Know, you do... cityscapes, yeah. Oh, cityscapes, yeah. <clears throat> all, uh, the... <laughs> all the all the angles and lines and perspective <laughs> yeah. and all of that stuff is like, whoa! <laughs> it's like overkill. My brain just gets fried <clears throat> out thinking about it, you know. But that's where it's good to do those little thumbnails and do several to kind of get everything where you think it ought to be before you get started that way you you don't make a mess out of the painting or the you know in the end product it may help ease your anxiety too your anxiety about mm -hmm. you know starting that's that's a good thing that's a good i've never spent too much time sketching i really should i i've got a sketchbook i just got blank pages in it <laughs> <laughs> sit down things out you know and i might, I might end up uh, creating some fantastic art that way. Mm -hmm. On my list, it's part of artist development. You know, <laughs> developing as a as a professional artist. That's just another little tip. And uh, before we close, there's one thing I'm going to say. And I'm probably going to get criticized for this, but um, the thing that has always it hasn't bothered me, but it makes me sad. Uh, I've encountered. Uh, other artists, uh, and I'm just I'm going to say creatives in general. So writers, journalists, they have a tendency. They they uh, they reach a certain point, you know, in their career where they're they're being noticed, and they are selling their work, and then they develop this um, this attitude of well, if you don't understand my work, it's because you're just not smart enough. They take this uh, elitist type mentality. And something that has always uh, humbled me is that uh, I come from a point of my art talent is a gift. And I've always believed that. And I was told by my, my grandmother years ago that I was given a gift from God and that I should always appreciate that. And as I put it out in the world, if other people accept that, then that I am doing the work of God. And, I, and so uh, I realize that not all artists come you know, from that belief point, but they have a tendency to want to use their creative talents. Now, this is my opinion. Okay, I know uh, you two probably don't share this, so my, for our listeners, this is Clyde's opinion. All right, so don't don't hammer the other two. Yeah, this is, just hammer me if you're upset with me. But they have a tendency to use their art or their talent as a way of controlling other people, and that's wrong, at least in my opinion. And it's it's a misuse of their talent. You know, uh, when listening to Stephen Baumann. He, when I learned, you know, about I Magnus and things, how we as artists, we, yes, we can control other people. We can control viewers with our art, but why not do it in a pleasant, wonderful, loving way? It, it makes me frustrated. 
and it uh, saddens me that I see other artists uh, do that. So we'll we'll leave it on that note. If you, do you two want to add anything to that, or I mean, well, just- I think some some artists like to draw attention to an issue that's going on or um, some problem in the world or whatever, and it might come across as though they're um, doing that, but um, maybe that it's because they're trying to draw attention to something negative that they want to get rid of instead of, you know what I mean? They're trying to uh, Some cases. put a light on it so people see that it's not a good thing to do. <laughs> but, I mean, everybody, it's your interpretation, so everybody will interpret what they see differently anyway, but um, it might not be interpreted the way the artists want people to interpret it. <laughs> so... Diane put a, Diane put a uh, positive spin on, on my negative comment. <laughs> <laughs> At least we're going to end, we're going to, instead of ending the, pos, the the podcast with a negative comment, we're going to end it with a very positive comment. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been listening to the Artist Friends Podcast, episode 74 for December the 7th, 2020. And you've been listening to Diane Hunt, Constance Bronson, and Clyde Kale. And I will say good night to Diane and Constance. Let Diane say good night to everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night, Clyde. Good night, Constance. Good night, Clyde. Good night, Diane. And good night, everybody. Thanks for listening. Good night, folks. And thank you so so much for listening. And as always, if you enjoy these podcasts, please <laughs> thumbs up. Give us a star rating. Let us know that you uh, you enjoy these shows, so we can uh, keep them up. Good night, folks. The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde Jade Kale. Participating artists, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson and Clyde Jade Kale. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Constance Bronson at www.etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash C-B-R-O-S-N-A-N-S. Clyde J. Kale at www.cjkaleartworks.com. If you would like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends Podcast, please email cjkale at sign mystery-otr.com. If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a thumbs up or a star rating. And most of all, send us your comments. This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons license.